Hello everyone. Today we're going to be looking at specific heat capacity. Now, specific heat capacity is basically all about how things heat up, how they get to certain temperatures, and what really distinguishes heating up a certain object as compared to another one. Now before I begin, I want to very, very quickly, very, very quickly talk through the difference between heat, which I'll represent by the letter Q, and temperature, which I'll represent by the letter T. Now heat, remember, is an actual form of energy. Heat is a form of energy. It's actually um, energy in, in the form of kinetic energy, which goes into translating particles within an object, um, causing them to spin, causing them to vibrate in certain um, free modes of um, in modes of motion, or to move around. Whilst temperature is the actual measure, is the actual measure of the average translational kinetic energy. So I want to be very very clear: heat is energy whilst temperature is the measure. And, um, and we're going to be using these two in a very connected fashion when we look at specific heat capacity. But I just want to make sure straight off the bat we recall those two definitions. Now, to start talking about what specific heat capacity is and where it all comes from, I want to basically start with a key question. How much energy does it take to heat something up to a certain temperature? So when I say something, I literally mean just a thing. It could be a block of metal, for example. It could be a pail of water, a bucket of water. It could be a bottle of water. Same substance, excluding of course the exterior, but a different amount of it. It could be a bottle of oil, the same kind of volume, but a different liquid. Again, it doesn't have to be solid, it doesn't have to be liquid, just something. Is it a gas? Is it a particle in the air? Is it something which changes phase, a block of ice, say, down there? Does it um, how much energy does it take it to not just turn into a liquid, but for that liquid to then heat up again? Now that ends up being a little, little more complicated. So we're actually going to just looking at the, at the, at the situations when the phase doesn't change. But the question remains the same: How much energy does it take to heat something up to a certain temperature, a certain goal temperature? Now. The idea of asking this question is to then start developing some intuitive guesses as to how energy is linked to temperature. Now keep in mind there are far more rigorous mathematical ways to do this. You can use uh, Maxwell-Boltzmann distributions, uh, equipartition theorems, some interesting derivatives and calculus, and you'll end up finding a similar, uh, a similar solution. But the goal for me in this video is to build up some intuition to not necessarily derive, but to motivate the formula for specific heat capacity. And it, or in the, at the very least, see why, why they're all connected in the way that they are, all the variables in that equation. But I don't want to give anything away, so let's start building this equation from scratch. So we're going to be looking at different objects and seeing how much energy it takes to heat them up to a certain temperature. We start off with the following. Let's say we had two of those objects, the bottle of water there, and the pail of water. Now, let's say I gave each of them one unit of energy. I'm going to represent a unit of energy by a single arrow. So I gave them each a unit of energy, a unit of energy. Now, my question to you, or well, considering I'm making the video, the question to nothingness is how much, I should say, which one of these objects will have a higher temperature after feeding them both one unit of energy? So I'm representing each of these arrows meaning one unit of energy. Or I should say one unit of heat. That would be better. One unit of heat. One unit of heat. Which of these objects will have a higher temperature? Now, in your mind, you may guess. Well, it's going to be this object here. It's going to be the bottle of water. But can we reason as to why that might be? Well, let's think about it. This bottle of water is made up of a bunch of molecules. Here's a couple of them. All right. A bunch of water molecules. Whilst the pail of water is made up of far more molecules, the mass of this object is far bigger. There's a lot more stuff in it. Okay, and then you can go there. I'm just going to keep going like this. Right. There's heaps and heaps of water molecules in this. If you think about it, this one unit of heat for this bottle of water has to disperse into all of these particles, all of these particles in here. So when you think about it, 
Um, the unit of heat disperses into fewer particles in this case as opposed to this case. The one unit of heat in for the bucket of water has to disperse into much, much more particles, or into many, many more particles, I should say. And so overall, each particle gets less of heat and less of energy. And therefore, overall, the, pail, the, the bucket of water has a lower temperature. Whilst as the bottle of water... The heat disperses amongst fewer molecules because it has a smaller mass. There are fewer, fewer molecules within that bottle. And so each of them has a higher average kinetic energy. And so the temperature of the bottle will be higher, even though we fed it one unit of heat, same as the bucket. So to kind of um, write this in a more definitive form, we can write it as the following. We expect that the greater the amount of a substance or the greater the mass of a substance, the more energy it would take to heat up. The more energy it would take to heat up. So what I mean by this is, um, if we wanted to get this bucket of water to the same temperature as this bottle of water, let's say after feeding this bottle of water one unit of heat, it raised, it got to a temperature of 20 degrees Celsius, say. I'm just, this is just very hypothetical, very um, flimsy kind of mathematics. But if I wanted to get this bucket of water to that same temperature, I would need to feed it more than one unit of heat. I need to feed it far more. Because then all of this extra unit of heat, those units of heat, would have to disperse amongst all of the molecules so that overall the average raised to 20 degrees Celsius. So we'd need more heat to get to the same temperature. So we expect things with different mass to require different amounts of heat to get to a certain temperature. So to write this mathematically, we write this as follows. Q is proportional to M. So Q is, of course, heat which is measured in joules, and M is mass, mass, measured in kg, mass, measured in kg. And this funny looking like three quarter infinity symbol means proportional to, meaning that um, if I was to double my mass, um, my the amount of heat required would also double. It also means that I'm not saying that the heat is proportional to mass squared or to mass cubed. It very well could be via our motivation, we have no idea. Um, but I'm, I'm telling you as a fact, I'm, and we're basically making an assumption here, that heat is proportional to mass. Again, this is not the rigorous def defini definition, this is just to motivate it. So we're going to say that, okay, heat is proportional to mass in some way. Okay, there's a good start, let's keep going. More intuition, let's start with a bucket of water now, but now let's compare it, let's compare it, um, or the situation I should say, uh, when it starts at a different temperature. So remember, the initial question was how much energy does it take to heat something up to a certain temperature? Now let's say we had this bucket of water and we wanted to, we wanted to get it, so the goal, the goal, well I should say, you know, the goal is that the final temperature, Tf, T final, equals to 90 degrees Celsius, equals to 90 degrees Celsius. You'll notice that I'm using Celsius here instead of Kelvin, which is the typical uh, kind of universal unit for heat when we study thermodynamics. Luckily for us, the Celsius scale the, and the Kelvin scale have the same um, unit division. Uh, so we can use them f most of the time interchangeably, at least for equations and the motivation we, we've got today. Uh, but we shouldn't generalize. But for the time being, it is okay to use Celsius. So let's say we want to get this bucket of water to 90 degrees Celsius. And let's say that the bucket of water starts at 80 degrees Celsius. This is a Celsius scale here. Let's say it starts at 80 degrees Celsius. Okay, so let's say this bucket needs uh, starts at 80 degrees Celsius. We feed it, let's say, I don't know, 5 units of energy. And it raises to 90 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's wonderful. Now let's think about something. What if it didn't start at 80? What if it started at, say, 50? 50 degrees Celsius, and we wanted to get it to 90 degrees Celsius. Could we also just feed it 5 units of energy to raise it to 90 degrees Celsius? Intuition says no. You would need far more units of energy, far more units of energy to heat this object up to 90 degrees Celsius, simply because it started, or its initial temperature was lower. And so that, that gives us a very, uh, a very key fact that the heat required is dependent on the difference between our final temperature and our initial, uh, and our initial temperature, Ti. And we can write that mathematically, but first here's the statement. The higher the temperature required, or maybe instead of required, um, 
Oh, the higher the temperature, the more heat we would need to achieve. To achieve said temperature. To achieve said temperature. Okay. So, mathematically, how do we write this? So, we previously had that heat is proportional to mass. Now, we just simply add the following. So, we know we now upgrade this into this. Instead of heat being just proportional to mass, it is proportional to mass and the difference between temperatures. So, this here, M delta T, this delta here, means change in. Means, sorry, change in. Change in temperature T, which is, this is temperature. And it should be measured in Kelvin, but it can be, for the most part, interchangeably measured in, in Celsius because their uh, the unit divisions are the same. We cannot use Fahrenheit um, because it's, it, it's not related to Kelvin in any way, shape, or form in, in a nice and neat fashion, I should say. Um, it's also just a pain to work with. So we're going to use Celsius. Now, um, <clears throat> Now, we could write this in a bit more of a, of a um, concrete fashion. Q is proportional to the mass of the object multiplied by the difference between final and initial temperatures. We could write it like that as well. That is the, exactly the same equation, just written a bit more expanded instead of the compact delta T form. Okay, so that's the second intuitive fact. Here's the next one. Let's say we had a block of metal, and let's say it had a mass of 300 grams, and it started at 5 degrees Celsius, shall we say. Now let's say we had the bottle of water, and we say it also has 300 grams worth of mass, and it also starts at 5 degrees Celsius. Now let's say I fed this bottle of water, 3 units of energy, and I fed this, um, this metal block, 3 units of energy. Do we expect that the after we feed each of these objects three units of energy, or three units of heat, I should say, that we would get to the same temperature? Would both of these objects reach the same final temperature after feeding each of them three units of energy? Well, the answer to that is no. We do not expect that. And but let's think about why. So in the bottle case, in the in, oh, not in the bottle case, in the in the case for water. The molecules here are in uh, are in liquid form, right? They are swimming around, they're moving around each other. The average kinetic energy is certainly higher. Whilst as in the block, in the block, the molecules are, are arranged in a nice, neat lattice, right? In a nice and neat lattice. There are also electrons whizzing around in this metal, though they contribute little to the characteristics of this object, oh, it, 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 well, thermodynamically. But you can see that the, simply the structure of these objects are, are, are very different. One's a solid, one's a liquid, one's in a lattice. Um, in the other case, the molecules are moving around. We could even have something different, like a, like glass, which is an amorphous solid, which is not a discrete uh, or a perfectly cut out lattice. Even the fact that this object has a certain shape to it also affects it. So overall, it seems to be the case that simply the characteristics of these objects also influence what final temperature they will arrive at after giving them a certain amount of heat. And so we may expect that the heat we need is dependent on the type of substance, its structure, and its characteristics. Now, unfortunately, we can't predetermine these without studying these objects on a quantum mechanical scale and then scaling up to a more classical um, instance. We typically can find out how each of these substances, um, how each of these substances' temperature rises depending on a certain amount of heat via experiment. But keep keeping this in mind, we can finish off our formula. We previously had heat being proportional to mass and the difference in initial and final temperatures. Now we can finally write it as follows: Q equals to m c delta t, where c is what we've been looking for this entire time, the specific heat capacity. And it is a trait uh, which every substance has. Every substance has a unique specific heat capacity, 
why should, well, I'm actually not sure if, if two different substances have the same specific heat capacity, but generally speaking, different substances have different um, the value, a different value of C. Um, and what it basically tells you, if we rearrange this equation, if we divide both sides by M delta T, we'll see the following. C equals to Q over M delta T. Now, if we look at the unit analysis here, Q is measured in joules, and then we have divided by a unit of a mass in kg and a unit of temperature in Kelvin. And so this is often written as, uh, the units of C are often written as joules per kilogram per Kelvin, or sometimes as joules per Kelvin per kilogram. Now, basically it's saying, well, how much energy, the, the value of C tells you how much energy you need to raise one kilogram of a certain object up by one degree Kelvin, or one degree Celsius. So to summarize, here we go. The specific heat capacity, or SHC, which is represented by the letter C in the Q equals to MC delta, delta T equation, is the following. The SHC tells you the amount of energy that is needed to increase one kilogram of a certain material by one degree Celsius, or one degree Kelvin. Its units are joules per kilogram per Kelvin. It can be used to connect temperature and heat and mass via the following equation, Q equals to M C delta T, or if you want the expanded form, Q equals to M C T F minus T I. It also has a little cute mnemonic, Q equals to M cat, where the A is the delta symbol. So if you forget the equation, you can remember Q, Q equals to M cat. But there is the equation that links heat to temperature and to the substance which is actually being um, heated up. So let's apply this in two examples. Oh, before we do, let's quickly actually talk about different materials. Glad this slide is here. So, um, forget what's written on the right for a second. If you look down the left here, if you look down the left here, you'll notice that water has, has a specific heat capacity of 4,186, while gold has a specific heat capacity of 129. So what this means is that, that water, water requires 4,186 joules to raise a kilogram of it up by one degree Kelvin, whilst as gold only needs 129 joules to heat up a kilogram of it by one Kelvin. So it actually requires less heat to heat up gold than it does for water. Keep that in mind. So it, water takes a lot of heat to raise by one degree Celsius. And similarly, it would also mean that in order for water to drop by one degree Celsius or one degree Kelvin, it must expel. It must expel uh, a lot of heat as well. So if I had a bit of water here, at 9 degrees Celsius, and I wanted to get it to 10 degrees Celsius, I would need to feed it, I would need to feed it 4,000, whoops, 4,186 joules to get it to here. But similarly, if I wanted this object to drop its temperature from 10 down to 9, that means the water would need to expel 4,186 joules worth of energy. So it goes both ways. Notice, though, that this, this does not mean that the melting point of gold is lower, just because its specific heat capacity is lower it is not directly related to specific heat capacity. In fact, the melting point of water is zero degrees Celsius. Right, that's when ice turns to, turns to water. Whilst as for gold, this, the melting point is roughly, it's not exactly, but roughly a uh, thousand degrees Celsius. So there's a stark difference, right? And it, they're not directly related. The, spe the specific heat capacity and the melting point, I mean. Uh, it's not related directly either to the vaporization point. All right, now let's see if we can apply this equation in some more concrete examples. So, uh, we're first given this fact that the specific heat capacity of water is 4186 joules per kilogram per Kelvin, or per Kelvin per kilogram here. So this here is C for water, C water. Okay, so let's have a look at the first question. If you were given 500 grams of water, how much thermal energy would you need to raise this temperature from five degrees to 95 degrees? Okay. So let's write down our key equation, mc delta t. Or we can write it as, if you like, q equals to mc, oops, tf minus ti, which is just the delta t term, t final minus t initial. Now, we're given 500 grams, so we're given a mass. We want to find the thermal energy, so we want to find q. q is our, is our, is our missing variable. And we want to raise this temperature from 5 degrees to 95 degrees. So here we're given Ti, that's Ti, and here we're given Tf. 
the final temperature. So uh, for this question, it's simply just a plug and play. So uh, the heat required Q equals to the mass 0 0.5 multiplied by the specific heat 4186 multiplied by T final, which is 95 minus 5. Now, typically we should write this in units of Kelvin. So we should actually add 273 to each of these numbers. But you'll find that the difference is the same because the difference in, um, or the unit difference for Celsius and Kelvin are exactly the same. They have the same interval. Okay, so when we, <clears throat> when we compute this, and allow me to just put this to my calculator, I am doing this live, so bear with me. We get 188,370 kilojoules. That's quite a lot. So that's, let's say, roughly 190 kilojoules, roughly 200 kilojoules. Um, that's quite a lot of energy to raise it by 90 degrees. To raise 500 grams of water. That's half a kg by, by 90 degrees. All right, now let's see this formula being used in a different setting. What if instead we delivered only 100 kilograms of heat, so roughly half the amount in part one? Um, to the 500 grams of water, which was initially at 5 degrees. What temperature would it be after heating? So again, here we're given Q in the form of 100 kilograms. We're given our mass, and we're given our initial temperature, 5 degrees. It asks, what temperature would it be after heating? So we're looking for TF, looking for the final temperature. So we have Q equals to M, <coughs> excuse me, MC um, delta T, or I'll do TF minus TI. And so we have 100,000, because it's 100 kilojoules, 100,000 joules equals to 0 0.5 times 4186 multiplied by final temperature, which is our unknown, minus our initial temperature of 5. So we can expand this out, 100,000 equals to, now let me quickly do 0 0.5 times 4186 which is equivalent to just dividing it by 2. So that's 2093, 2093, well, I could have just done it in my head, 2093 multiplied by TF minus 5. We um, open up the brackets to find we have 2093 TF minus 2093 times 5, which is 10,465. Add that to the other side, so we have 110,465 equals to 2093 multiplied by the, by the final temperature. And we will find when we divide both sides by 2093 that our final temperature will be, our final temperature will be, let me just type it in here. I can't definitely can't do that one in my head. Um, 2093 equals to 52.77 degrees. Celsius, or if you were using um, Kelvin, you would find that to be um, 52.77 plus 273, whatever that number is, degrees Kelvin. Um, which, in, in this number actually does make sense. If you think about it, we, we got from roughly, in the first question, we went from roughly zero degrees to roughly 100 degrees, and we used roughly 200 um, kilojoules. In the second question, we're given 100 kilojoules, and we end up at roughly halfway between zero and 100 degrees. So... Um, intuitively that also checks out. So this is a very, very typical instance of how a specific heat capacity question might go, but it's beyond the question. It's just a, a, a good tool to see how the temperature of an object changes or how much energy you'd need to feed into a certain substance. So for instance, when you're boiling your kettle, how much energy do you need to be flowing into your kettle? When that corresponds to, again, how much perhaps electric current do you need to flow into your kettle? Or vice versa, if you have coal, which is, um, or wood, which is cooling down, or water, which is cooling down, how much energy will it give off into its environment whilst it's doing so? Is it better to run liquid gold to uh, pass an object to cool it down, or liquid water to pass an object to cool it down? All those kind of concepts can be linked to the specific heat capacity and to the value of C for each particular substance. Because it tells you directly how much energy it takes for one kilogram of an object to raise its temperature by one degree Kelvin. So there you have it. There's an introduction into specific heat capacity. See you later.